United Nations Security Council diplomats on Monday as he tries to rally an international coalition to rein in Tehran. U.S. officials plan to show debris from a ballistic missile fired from Yemen into Saudi Arabia to make the case that Iran was illegally arming Houthi rebels in Yemen. James Carafano is a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation and a security and foreign policy analyst. James, good to see you today, and thanks for weighing in on this issue. As you know, this is the, uh, the second working lunch that President Trump is having with the U.N. Security Council diplomats. Uh, the Trump administration says it's actually pursuing, if you will, a two-track approach, an effort with Congress and with European allies to deal with what they call flaws in the Iran nuclear deal. What are those flaws? Well, the, the single biggest flaw in the Iran nuclear deal is it, it never covered ballistic missiles. And... As you know, you don't have a nuclear threat unless you have a nuclear weapon, but more importantly, a missile that you can put it on to shoot somebody. So there are no constraints at all, serious constraints on the ballistic missile program, and that, and that is the single greatest flaw in the whole agreement. You and Ambassador Nikki Haley, uh, of course, has argued that Iran is still considered a major sponsor of terrorism, and she recently called out the Iranians, claiming they're not supposed to be providing missiles or arms to any other country, but she also points out that Iran has done that, violating that by supplying weapons to Syria and the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Uh, Iran, of course, denies this, but what proof does the United States have, or what proof does Iran have, I should say, that, that they're not involved in this? Well. The Iranians would have a very difficult uh, time making the case that they're not a state sponsor of terrorism and that they haven't delivered weapons to the Houthi uh, rebels that they've uh, fired at the United States. You know, the great, one of the great arguments for the Iran deal, the JPCO Day deal, was, look, this will bring Iran into the international community, it will moderate its behavior, and it will make the Middle East more stable. And, and we've seen exactly the opposite. They have ramped up their support for transnational terrorist groups. They've charged ahead in their ballistic missile program. We have no confidence that they've actually constrained their, their nuclear program over the long term. So the, the deal has demonstrably failed to deliver on the, on the promises that the last administration made. That's, what, that's exactly why the United States has really kind of flip-flopped its entire approach towards Iran. You know, you, you raise a good point there. While they've ramped up uh, their outreach to, uh, to sponsor terrorism, they've also, it appears, ramped up their oppression of their own people in regard to, look, they've re they received billions of dollars. And as we've noted through previous, uh, through previous demonstrations that we've seen on the streets of Tehran and throughout Iran, that they have denied people the money they need to survive in their own country after receiving billions of dollars through this nuclear deal. What can the United States point to to say that is a, also evidence of the fact that Iran is not complying with the nuclear deal? Well, I don't think this is not a situation where they're, they're complying with the deal. But again, the whole idea was is that if you engage Iran, it would ameliorate its behavior. And so part of the, the price of engagement, part of them signing the deal, which literally is just a 10-year agreement, which may or may not actually prevent them from getting nuclear weapons, but that opened them up to investment from the West, from the re to return of, of sanctioned funds to Iran, and which literally amounted to billions and billions of dollars. And we can demonstrably show that what have they done with that money? They've ramped up their support for state sponsorship of terrorism. They've enriched the people that run the country, but actually to the people in Iran are actually worse off economically now than they were before the, the Iran deal was signed. I'm glad you mentioned and pointed out the 10-year uh, sunset clause, as it's, as it's known as, because after the ten, 10 years, they can go on and develop anything they want to. And that is one of the aspects of this deal that infuriates President Trump. What can the Trump administration do to pull out of the nuclear deal with Iran? And what impact would that have, particularly with European allies who seem to feel that this is a good deal? Well, you know, to be honest, every European official I've ever talked to acknowledges that the Iran deal was not a good deal and that they primarily went along with it. Because but why are they saying it publicly? Uh, is, is it something that they didn't want to, to be in conflict with President Obama? Uh, why are they saying it publicly that, that this is a good deal and they express concerns about President Trump pulling out of? Are they, what are they afraid of? Well, I mean, they were arm-twisted by the Obama administration, so they, and they don't want to admit that. Uh, 
they feel that they're in the deal now and they, and they have to prove that it works. And there are economic interests in Europe that want to invest in Iran and, and turning off the deal would alienate those economic interests. But, but here's, I think, the, the little known credit or little given credit to the administration. One is the president is not impulsive. He didn't just repulsively, impulsively right. pull out a deal. And the other thing is he's actually listened to and work with European allies to say, we have a structure which gives us some controls, let's build on that. And what the president's trying to do is build really kind of side agreements around the Iran deal. First of all, extending past the sunset call, uh, the, the sunset right. clause, right? So to continue the, 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 the constraints on the nuclear program, but also to deal with the ballistic missile programs and other things. So if we can get these side but, agreements. Yeah, all these side agreements and everything, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but we're losing time here. The bottom line is you're trying to develop a situation where you're going to deal with a country that you do not trust and that a country that doesn't trust you. So how do you find uh, that middle of the road to get the right kind of compromise, the right kind of deal to make sure that Iran's uh, petulance and as well as its appetite for developing nuclear weapons does not become an ongoing conflict? Well, I, th I think there are two things. One is you, you pressure the Europeans who recognize the deal isn't working, and then the end, and Iran is destabilizing to the Middle East. That's bad for them, and Iran is potentially a threat to them. So the, uh, the, the, the European allies realize we need to do better. And also you pressure Iran. This is not a regime that's in great shape. Look, the, their own people hate the regime, and they're getting a lot of pushback in the region and, the, and a, a lot of pushback on the surrogates. So they're under a lot of pressure, and it is a conservative regime that in the end of the day wants to stay in power. So I think the president has a decent hand here, and if he plays it strong and with competent and persistent, persistently, you know, we might get to a much, much better place, honestly, than, than we deserve. All right, James Carfano, thank you for that. And obviously the president has a very important day Monday as he deals with this situation. Thank you, sir. Thank a Louisiana you. jury finding the man accused in the road race.